At the beginning of March this year, three independent Russian militias took up arms against their own state. Ukraine supports the groups but distances itself from their operations, stressing they act independently and have their own objectives. DW correspondent Maksana met the leader of one of these militias who sees the war as an opportunity to overthrow the government in Moscow and create a Russia according to his own right-wing extremist views. Denis Nikitin has a security detail wherever he goes. He says Russian President Vladimir Putin wants him dead. There is no other opposition left in Russia. We are the opposition, and I think we made that very clear. Denis Nikitin is the founder of the Russian Volunteer Corps, a militia fighting alongside Ukraine. They took part in an incursion into Russia last month, attracting significant pushback. Soldiers, equipment and armoured vehicles, all of this was brought in from other parts of the front line. This equipment missing somewhere else made it easier for our Ukrainian comrades. Just hours after the incursion, Moscow announced it had been thwarted. In reality, the fighting lasted many days. Fighting on its own territory, not exactly Moscow's plan. Yet, the Ukrainian authorities want to distance themselves from the operation. These were exclusively citizens of Russia or former citizens of Russia, who, as a matter of fact, conducted and directly participated in hostilities. It was their initiative, it was their decision, and it was their planning. Strictly speaking, the representatives of the armed forces of Ukraine did not issue a single order to cross the border or invade the territory of Russia. Of course, there was support. Of course, there was coordination. Three Russian units said they carried out the attack. They were together on the battlefield and at this press conference. But wanting to hurt Putin's Russia is where their commonality ends. The Legion Freedom of Russia is seen as liberal. The Siberian battalion is made up mainly of minorities from Russia. Nikitin's Volunteer Corps describes itself as nationalist and has a far-right agenda. We see us as fighting a war of national liberation. Russia, the Russians, are suffering under Putin. The country is flooded with migrants. We can see the consequences with terrorist attacks and an extremely tense situation with crime similar to Germany, France or England. Nikitin moved to Germany in his late teens. He became a well-known figure in the European neo-Nazi scene. His cap is from his White Rex fashion line, popular with neo-Nazis. He also organized and took part in mixed martial arts events, which drew participants from all over Europe. Today, Nikitin is banned from entering the Schengen Zone, which covers 29 European countries. But he says he's also fighting to protect the people who've rejected him. Despite my conservative political and traditional views, I, as well as my comrades, risked our lives. We serve as a shield that protects even the decadent ways of life in Europe and the West. And that is a very important fact. Russia justified its invasion of Ukraine with the lie that it was denazifying it. This in a country where the far right doesn't hold a single parliamentary seat. Ukraine cooperating with neo-Nazis might seem counterintuitive. Why do we work with these people and that we want to save our lives? Because our priority is our country, our people, our territory, our independence. And actually, let's win first and then we'll decide. Did we do it right or wrong? For now, the enemy of Ukraine's enemy counts as some kind of friend. 
Well, Max Sander filed this report and joins us now in the studio. Max, you talked to the leader of one of those Russian militias. Who joins them and what are they after? Right, so I, I think in general it's an interesting question as to who what foreigner comes to Ukraine to fight and uh, support Ukraine in this war? Um, especially in the beginning of the war, we saw a lot of people who were some seeking for an adventure, others um, really there for a purpose, trying to help. Um, now um, we see a lot of uh, uh, foreign fighters who are in, 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 in for the money, actually. And um, with the Russian fighters, um, some of these factors may apply also, but the, the, the common denominator that all these uh, groups have is that they want to bring down the Russian regime want to bring down Vladimir Putin. Now, um, when we look at um, two of the groups, the, the Russian Legion, Freedom of Russia, and the Siberian Battalion, which was just recently formed, they are mainly fighting groups. They have more liberal values. If we look at Erika, um, uh, the leader, Denis Nikitin, who you just saw in, saw in, uh, in, in that uh, report, um, it is a fighting group. It is a militia, but it's also a political movement of the, the very far right. Mm -hmm. um, members of this group are at least um, on the very right spectrum of conservatism, if you can call it that, um, but they also harbor neo-Nazis, including uh, leader Dennis, uh, Dennis Nikitin. Um, he has a political agenda. He has a political view. He wants to change Russia. He wants to create a Russia for ethnic Russians, for white people. He is against migration. And he wants to develop as a political power um, in the Russian opposition. Now, uh, I think it's also important to mention that not everybody um, in RDK um, uh, is, has a political um, ambition uh, like him. Um, some of them see, them see themselves merely as fighters, but they are not reluctant to fight alongside these people. All right. Strange bedfellows, for sure, for Ukraine. Ukraine admits to working with them, but to what extent do they really cooperate and coordinate? Right. So, um, of course, there has to be cooperation and coordination. Um, these militias are based in Ukraine. Um, they cross the border, and this is not the first uh, cross-border incursion that has happened um, um, from uh, Adika and, and from, from the Legion, as, as far as we know. There is support from the leadership. This has been greenlighted from the very top of the Ukrainian leadership. There is help with training, um, military intelligence uh, of Ukraine, uh, vets the new recruits, make sure there are no spies. There is also help with um, with equipment. Now, the main selling point of the Ukrainians, though, is that um, these are Russians, Russian citizens fighting in Russia. They say once they cross the border, they are on their own. They can do what they want. This is very, a very comfortable uh, way of seeing this for the Ukrainians, of course. They can distance themselves from the actions that are being carried out on Russian territory um, in front of uh, Moscow, but also in front of uh, the allies who don't want an escalation and who don't want Ukrainian troops on, on uh, Russian territory. Um, if, if you ask a question as, as to why, um, why the Ukrainians are actually cooperating with these groups in the first place, is they are in a very difficult position. They need all the help that they can get. Um, you could also argue that the Ukrainians are just using them and they, they, they could drop them at, at any point if, if they wanted to. Um, and it does play into the propaganda, of course, that the Russians are saying, OK, uh, Ukraine um, is... Uh, that needs to be denazified. Needs to be right? denazified. So this gives it a little, a, just a little tiny bit of, pr uh, of, of truth, though. Um, but this is a very, this is a relatively small group. Um, and um, I, I believe the, the, the benefits outweigh um, the negatives for the, for you, the Ukrainians here, though, because the Russian propaganda is going to do what the Russian propaganda does anyway. So they're going to say this anyways. Yeah. And let's talk about the effect this has had in practical terms. Has that made any change to the status quo on the battlefield, on the ground for Ukraine, which is on the back foot right now. Right. So um, this was a limited military op operation. This was an incursion that lasted um, a few days, more than a week, most likely started March 12. Um, the, the, the groups uh, crossed the, the border into the, the southern Russian provinces and they uh, took some territory there. They fought against the Russian troops. They managed to um, hold territory for some time, uh, make, make some prisoners. And most importantly, they um, got the attention of the Russians. So the Russians had to divert their attention, had to divert troops there to, 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 to counter this incursion. Um, but then, very important to stress here, these groups are, are small. We don't know how big they actually are, but these could be a few hundred, a few thousand at max. This is not a significant military force. What is more important is not the military effect, but the propaganda effect. We're sitting here talking about what happened there. And uh, in Russia, there wasn't a reaction as well. Um, people had to be evacuated. Um, the Russian president had to acknowledge that there is opposition, that there are Russians in his country, though he says this is, this is, this is, these, are, these are puppets uh, that uh, belong to the West. But they, they had to acknowledge that 
this situation exists and um, they had to and President Vladimir Putin um, promised to hunt these these fighters down and there were retaliatory strikes uh, airstrikes against uh, many Ukrainian cities uh, as a consequence there too. Fascinating story. That was our correspondent Maxana. Thank you so much for your reporting.